Okay, so this video is an introduction to particles and radiation, which is a section of the AS physics course. It's quite a large section of the course, and this video is just going to be recapping some of the GCSE level physics that goes behind this section. So I'm going to start by just talking about one of the most basic concepts from GCSE physics, which is the structure of an atom. So you're taught at GCSE that an atom has a nucleus, which is positive, and it's surrounded by electrons, which are negative. And now what you want to know for A-level physics is what holds this whole atom together is something called the electromagnetic force. And that is what holds this negative charge <coughs> to this positive charge. So now we'll actually look at this atom in a bit more detail. So here we've got a diagram of a helium atom. We've got some electrons out here, which are blue. We've got some protons, which are red. And we've got some neutrons, which are grey. So we'll look at these again. So these are called subatomic particles because they are subatomic. They're smaller than the atom. They're inside the atom. The electron is actually the smallest of these subatomic particles, and what I mean by that is it has the lowest mass. The neutron and the proton have about the same mass, and I say about because it is slightly different, and I'll look at that in a minute. Uh, now we'll talk about charge. The electron has a negative charge, the neutron has no charge, and the proton has a positive charge. And you can kind of see how that works here. You've got your negative electrons on the outside, and you've got your neutral and positive on the nucleus here. The nucleus is going to have an overall positive charge. The outside is going to have an overall negative charge, and that's what's going to hold it all together. Uh, you might be wondering what holds the nucleus together with the positive charges, and uh, I'll actually talk about that in the next video, or maybe two videos' time, depending on when that comes up. But that it does come up in A-level physics. Okay, so with A-level physics, you need to know a bit about some actual data to do with these subatomic particles. And I've got a table here. At first, it can look a bit daunting because there are some very small values on the table. But we've got five columns here. We've got the type of particle. We've got the actual mass of each of the particles in kilograms. We've got the actual charge of each of the particles in coulombs. And we've got the relative values in these last two here, which I'll talk about in a minute. So for starters, with the electron, it's got a very low actual mass. You've got the numbers in front of it here, 9.11. And it's times 10 to the minus 31. So that is a very small number. You've got the neutron here, which is about 1.67 and the proton here which is also about 1.67 and they're times 10 to the minus 27 so they're very small but they're not quite as small as the times 10 to the minus 31 electron here uh, I did mention that the neutron and proton have slightly different masses and as you can see here they actually do I did these to four significant figures just so you could see that uh, you don't actually need to know why for A-level physics I might do a different video if enough of you are interested but they are slightly different the neutron is slightly heavier and has slightly more mass now we'll look at the charges here. So an electron has a charge of a minus charge, the neutron has no charge, and the proton has a positive charge. And the values for the actual charge on an electron in coulombs are minus 1.6 times 10 to the 19. And for a proton, it's exactly the same, but positive. So positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So that's quite an important thing to remember, that they are both the exact same, just opposite values, like negative and positive. Now, the thing about these values here is that they are all very small, and in science that can make them quite difficult to work with and do calculations with. So they are actually, well, what scientists actually do is they convert them to these relative masses and relative charges, which are, as you can see, much nicer whole numbers, which just sort of work a lot nicer for the calculations. So the relative masses of these three particles, for the electron, is still quite a small number, uh, about 0 0.0005. For the neutron, it's 1, and for the proton, it's also 1. So these are relative, they're, uh, they're not exact relative values, but they're about 1 and about 1, and that's all you need to know for AS. It does say in the specification that you need to know about relative, that relative mass is measured in atomic mass units, where one atomic mass unit, which is abbreviated by the lowercase u, is equal to 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So as you can see here, this works out. It's not clear to see initially, but this, when converted, turns to be about 0 0.000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, sorry about that, 0.0005u, 
neutrons turn out to be about one, protons also turn out to be about one. And then if you look at relative charge here, it's also quite clear to see that an electron has a relative charge of negative one, a proton positive one, one and one, they're equal, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, they're also about equal. Whereas a neutron still has negative or neutral charge of zero. Here, I've just got what I've said summarized in text if you prefer to read it. And another important thing to know is that the exam data sheet you'll be given, at least I know for the AQA exam, does contain the actual masses of all three of these, as well as the actual charge in coulombs of an electron. And if you know the actual charge in coulombs for an electron, you know it for a proton, and you will have to remember these relative masses and relative charges, which is slightly annoying, but this is GCSE level, so it shouldn't be too difficult. The only thing that's really new on this slide is these values here. So now we'll move on with the video. Okay, so you also need to know about some important numbers when referring to atomic structure. And the first of those is proton number. At GCSE, I think this was covered. It may have been called atomic number, I'm not sure, but it means the same thing. And it's defined as the total number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. Uh, this is important because an atom or an element is defined by the number of protons it has in its, in its nucleus. So a group of atoms all have the same number of protons are all the same element. So no two elements can have the same number of protons, if that makes sense. It's also important because the number of protons and electrons in a neutral atom are equal. So if you've got a neutral atom that you know the proton number of, you also know its electron number. So here I've got that written down, if you prefer to read it. The next number or value we're going to talk about is the nucleon number. It's very similar to proton number. The only difference is that it includes neutrons, so it's the total number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus. Uh, and that's just the other thing I wanted to mention, that if you've got a proton and if you've got a neutron, they are collectively combined to be called nucleons, because they are in the nucleus of an atom. That's quite important to know, because that will become up quite a bit in this topic. Protons and neutrons combined can be called nucleons, henceforth this is called the nucleon number. Uh, the other thing about this number here is that we've just dis we've just discussed about the fact that nucleons have a relative mass of one. We've talked protons and neutrons both have the relative masses of one in that table, which means that the nucleon number is actually equal to the relative atomic mass of uh, an atom. So if you're given the nucleon number, you know the relative atomic mass of it. That's why the nuclear number can also be referred to as the mass number. Now, these two numbers here, as you can see, I've got a Z and an A next to them, and that's because the abbreviation for proton number is Z, and the abbreviation for nuclear number is A. And that leads us on to that leads us on to the next thing, which is nuclide notation. And nuclide notation is actually just a way to summarize all the information, all the basic information about the atomic structure of an atom in one notation, and you'll have most likely seen it before if you're doing A-level physics because nuclide notation is actually used all over the periodic table each of the elements is written in its nuclide notation and you'll see what I mean now it looks like this here where if I grab my pen A is the nuclear number or the mass number Z is the proton number or the atomic number and X is actually the element symbol so, for example, for carbon, it'd be a capital C. So that's the element symbol. And, of course, we are going to look at an example of this. So if I actually change this pen colour here, I didn't change it. Uh, an example of this might be uranium. So the element symbol for uranium is a capital U. Uranium has, if I can just look over here, 238 nucleons in its nucleus. So that's 238 total number of protons and neutrons. And of those 238, 92 are protons. So Z, or the proton number, is 92. So if you wanted to work out the neutron number for this, 
there's, there's not actually a value called a neutron number, but it might give you a nuclide notation and ask you to work out the number of neutrons in this atom. What you actually do, all you have to do is just do A minus Z. Because if you think about it, you've got your total number of protons and neutrons minus your total number of protons, you're going to get your total number of neutrons. So for this one, it'd be 238 minus 92, which equals, I think it's 146. So that is basically what you've got to write down. And that is how you work out the number of neutrons. Uh, one last thing is that nuclide notation can also be referred to as the isotopic notation. So let's move on again. Now I just mentioned something called isotopic notation and you might be wondering what isotopic means and it's actually related to the word isotope. Uh, you should know what an isotope is if you've done GCSE physics but I am going to explain it again just in case you haven't and you're watching this video out of interest. An isotope is, is quite difficult to explain really. For a given element it might have multiple isotopes and we've just talked about the fact that an element is defined by the number of protons in its nucleus However, for a given element, it may have different versions of the atom which have a varying number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons might change. So uh, this is quite difficult to explain, so I'm actually going to use an example. So if I get rid of that, this just talks about it here a bit. So an isotope is defined as uh, an atom or a group of atoms with the same number of protons, so they're the same element, but they have different numbers of neutrons. So the example I'm going to use for this is hydrogen, which has three different isotopes. The first is protium. You've got one proton, so it is hydrogen, because hydrogen is the element with one proton. Anything with one proton is going to be hydrogen. So it's protium. No, no nucleon or no other nucleons apart from this one proton. Now we'll look at the second isotope, which is deuterium. And deuterium has a neutron as well as a proton. So it's still hydrogen with its one proton, but it also has a neutron, so it has a different number of neutrons or a different nucleon number and a different mass. And the third isotope is tritium, which has two extra neutrons in there. So it is still hydrogen with its one proton, but it's got more nucleons and more mass. And what I'm actually going to do for each of these is write out the nuclide notation. So they're all hydrogen. They've all got one proton, so the Z is one. However, the A, or the nucleon number, changes for each of them. So this is known as protium, or hydrogen one. This is deuterium, or hydrogen two. And this is tritium, or hydrogen three. So that's an okay way of explaining it. Uh, the next thing you need to know about isotopes is that the number of neutrons in an atom in no way affects its chemical properties. So each of these here all have the same chemical properties even though they have different numbers of neutrons. What does change is their physical properties but that's not something you have to worry about. All you need to know is that the chemical properties are not changed by the number of neutrons. Uh, if you want to know a bit more about that you can look into electron structure however that is more to do with chemistry than it is to do with AS physics so don't worry about that for now. Just remember number of neutrons doesn't affect chemical properties. So let's just bring that up here. I've written that here. And now the next bit I've written about here, you can read it or you can listen to me. Uh, the number of neutrons in a nucleus does actually affect the stability of the nucleus. And what I mean by that is, usually the more neutrons compared to protons there are in a nucleus, the more unstable it is. And what unstable means is that it is likely to decay or give off neutrons in some way to become more stable and becoming more stable means to become an isotope that has a more even number of protons and neutrons. So for example, if we look at this here, protium is going to be pretty stable. It's extremely stable because all it has is one proton. Deuterium would be less stable because it has, it'd still be quite stable, but it would be less stable because it has a neutron. And then tritium would be more unstable than deuterium because it has got two neutrons, so it's got a fair amount of it's got an extra neutron when compared to the number of protons so it could decay into deuterium and then into protium 
However, this doesn't really happen with lighter elements as commonly as it does with heavier elements. So if we take our example of uranium a while ago, it had over 200 nucleons. So you can imagine, if it has a lot more neutrons than it does protons, it's going to be very unstable. In an actual fact, it's, it's known as radioactive, which means it's, it's likely to decay, or it does decay. Uh, if a, a nucleus is radioactive, it does decay. And so it's very unstable and it will decay. So that's the other thing you need to know about isotopes, is that you can get unstable isotopes, which have a lot of neutrons, and they will decay. The final thing to do with isotopes, and this video in fact, is actually the uses of isotopes, or how they can be actually used in real life. And now, what I'm going to do for that is I'm going to use the example that I read in a textbook, which is to do with an isotope known as carbon-14. So I'll write that down here. And what this means is it's got 14 nucleons, which means it's carbon, so it has 6 protons and 8 neutrons. And what there actually is in our atmosphere is quite a lot of carbon-14 that we all take in through respiration or other means. So all living things have about the same amount of carbon-14 in them. However, when we die, obviously we stop taking in this carbon-14. And what scientists can do is, say when an animal dies or a species dies out hundreds of thousands of years ago, when it died, it would stop having or stop taking in carbon-14, so it would have a certain amount in it, which is about the same for all living things. And slowly, as time goes on, the amount of carbon-14 decreases over time, and this is because it is unstable, so over time it will decay and become more stable isotopes, such as, for example, carbon-12, which has six protons and six neutrons. So as you can see, it's got a much more even ratio, so it is more stable, so this will decay to become this. And what scientists can do is they can look at the amount of carbon-14 in an archaeological find, and then they can, from there, work out how long ago it was that this archaeological find died or was buried or anything, really. So that is just one example of what a use of isotopes would be. You might get asked about this in your exam, although I'm not entirely sure. So it's good to remember this example. Carbon-14, we've all got it, all got it in us. When something dies, if it's dug up hundreds of years later, the amount of carbon-14 will have changed, and they can use the amount that's left, work out how much has decayed, work out when this thing died. So that's a brief explanation of a use. So that concludes this video. Sorry if it's been a bit rushed or a bit untidy, but it is the first video on this channel, so feedback is appreciated. Uh, I will be uploading a new video soon, and thanks for watching.